right? So you can see the screen and everything, right? Yeah. Yes. So first off, allow me to apologize because my voice just abandoned me cruelly today. And then I would like to thank all the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today here in this lovely workshop about uh, universal bounds in non-equilibrium energy harvesting systems. Let me just say to begin with that all of this is going to be contained in, in, this, in this paper that is now available on archive. And our research question begins with the following, which is we look at all of these molecular systems that have this twofold structure in which we have some say in this case the Krebs cycle we have some backbone structure biochemical structure it basically is going to be driven out of equilibrium via these enzymes that are operating on top and therefore its main goal is to actually extract some ATP and store it into some reservoir now we call these such, such systems energy harvesting systems and we ask the question are there limitations are there thermodynamical limitations that we can actually derive uh, formally for these types of molecular energy harvesting systems. We believe so, and I'm going to teach you very quickly how do we actually go on and uh, tackle this problem. To begin with, we need to have some uh, a bit of a, a, a setup or some definitions, and we actually are going to consider the following system where we have a non-equilibrium environment, and then we have what we call the baseline um, transition rates. These are going to be all encoded in this matrix R, right? Then we also have a reservoir with which you can exchange heat. And we have very importantly, a work reservoir where we actually will store this energy that the system's goal is to basically um, harvest, right? Uh, the non-equilibrium environment is actually going to drive the system, which is going to be an important part. And then uh, at this point, we'll say that there is one unique uh, non-equilibrium steady state, which we call pi for this uh, system so far. You think of this system as the backbone so far here, we have, if you want, this biochemical backbone that I just showed before from the Krebs cycle. And now we add another type of transitions, which we name control, but this is just nomenclature. It's not exactly, we can think of them as control from control theory, but it's not really necessary to think of this this way. It's just nomenclature that we add. And these are going to be timed, right? So for example, the transition matrix uh, corresponds to this new set of transitions that we put on top of the previous baseline is going to be primed. Also, there will be some, exchange, some work exchange with the reservoir and as well some dissipation. But importantly, control, we will set it in such a way that it cannot be uh, invoked such that it changes the driver of the non-equilibrium environment. Right? So the environment comes as part of the baseline and its driving comes as part of the baseline, but not, but not as part of this control. Let me give you a very simple example that I hope that will somehow move us beyond this formal definition into something that it's a bit more tangible and we actually solve this problem in our paper. This, we solve also two other problems and this, this particular one consists of a ring of states. There is like just end states. If you forget about this thing over here for a second, if you consider the fully symmetric uh, ring, it's just a diffusive ring, right? So we expect this to go into some equilibrium uh, steady state, which is basically unidistributed. Now let's consider how the environment is going to, to apply here. And we are going to do it in a very, very simple form. Actually, we're going to take it to be dissipative less, although you can also add that, it's not a problem. Suppose that uh, our environment in this cycle basically uh, works as follows. If there's a transition from one to two, then theta KT or theta joules of energy is going to be uh, stored into the into the work reservoir and then vice versa if there's a transition from two to one and three. For this particular example, we take it to be DC, but if less, we can also move beyond that. So how, if this is the baseline of my system, how uh, can I imagine those control mechanisms, those control transitions? Well, we can think of them as, as I said, as I introduced in the beginning, just, just a, as an enzyme, right? That can be driven uh, out of like, uh, depleting part of the energy available from the work reservoir disconnected to the system. It also can include some dissipation. And this, basically the goal here is that if I manage to have such an enzyme, right, maybe we can think of as an evolutionary process that leads, uh, gives rise to this enzyme, then I can drive this system in a clockwise manner there in, in a way that I can store more and more energy. And then here the problem is, is there some balance because this is also, this self-maintaining process that corresponds to this control, quote unquote, mechanisms, they also entail some cost, some costs, sorry. And then the question is, can we actually find some universal balance that, that will give us sort of like an upper bound on the maximum uh, power that it can be 
stored in in this in this way. To, before we, we we go to the main goal here, let me just uh, maybe rephrase this whole situation into a bit of a more formal but also heuristic sort of approach. Remember that I said pi was our um, uh, a steady state for the baseline. Therefore, this is without any control mechanisms. Of course, it doesn't have to be equidistributed all the time, just like for uh, exemplary purposes here it is. And now when I add a control mechanism, all I'm, all I'm doing is I'm shifting away from this uh, baseline distribution, right, to another distribution, which basically its aim is to actually map or get closer to this distribution of the states that yield the highest amount of energy into the reservoir. Right, so this is sort of what is the uh, operation that is being carried on underneath this process of adding control mechanisms. This is the goal of the system to harvest uh, the, the most, um, the maximum amount of energy possible, or maximum amount of power. And but importantly, whenever you have such a such a uh, departure from one from one distribution to another, then you can actually uh, have some cost that can be measured through entropic terms, and you'll see how in a second. This actually uh, leads me to the main uh, the main point of this of this talk, which is the result here. What what are we seeing here is on on the left hand side we have the maximum increase on power that can ever be achieved for any given system with separated, as I explained, with a baseline and control mechanisms. But on the right hand side we have the computation for this upper bound. This is an upper bound, and importantly, just very briefly. This uh, right hand side corresponds to a convex optimization problem that contains two terms. It's like a trade off, right? On the one hand, we have the cost of maintaining the speed, this distribution that is going to be far away from pi. Pi, remember, is the baseline steady state distribution. You can, this is actually an entropic term here. And then the other term will just be the benefits, which, in, which it comes in terms of, 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 of workflow, okay? Just to, to be clear, all of these V and Q, this, these are all um, fluxes. So these are not just uh, gross values, but actually fluxes on this system at steady state. Great, and now we see one, of, one important result here is that this upper bound, if you actually go in detail and, and observe these two terms, this upper bound is, is computed regardless of the control mechanisms that one should impose. What does this mean? This means that remember in our previous example, right? In this sort of like uh, bio, biochemically inspired example, we had an enzyme over here and we said, oh, this enzyme can be driving the system in a way that I get a, a net current over in the clockwise direction. So force, and therefore I can extract more energy than if I stay in the steady state, which in this case gives, yields no net energy, no net power to the system. But the point of this result is that if I, for example, imagine any other set of control mechanisms, these are actually going to be bounded exactly by the same uh, computation here, which is given by this convex optimization problem, all right? Now, this convex optimization problem, which basically aims is at finding this solution P, which we show, which we show can, be, can be always found, and also that it can be saturated by using Markovian um, control mechanisms. But then you, you first need to, show, need to solve this problem, this convex optimization problem, which is not a trivial thing to do. And in fact, uh, not even for a two-state system, you'll find close, general closed form solutions. However, there are closed form solutions in three distinctive regimes that we, uh, that we show in the paper and describe how to, how to arrive at them. Very, very briefly, and again, from a heuristical standpoint, these three regimes, we, tell, we term them linear response, macroscopic, and far from equilibrium. In each of the cases, for example, here, it's kind of easy to understand what's going on, right? Here we have the baseline, again, in the same sort of like uh, heuristic approach, we have the baseline. And deviating from the baseline is rather costly. So this means that this term here is very high. And therefore, you can only go ever so slightly away from the baseline. And that actually gives rise to some approximation that you can solve in a closed form solution. The macroscopic case is kind of, kind of the other extreme. I'll give some hint at the, towards the end of the talk of, of how do you actually make sure whether you are in the macroscopic or the linear response regime. But very naively, this uh, corresponds to the case in which you have a high abundance of energy, say that you have a very high abundance of glucose in the system, for example. And therefore, you can spend as much energy as you want to pay this cost, and you just go into a delta function. Okay, this is very extreme, of course, but it's just uh, like a mathematical approach. All right. Um, and then finally, far from equilibrium is just a, a perturbative expansion of this macroscopic regime. These three cases can be explicitly put in closed form for any uh, 
for any system. For the case of the ring that I showed you, uh, we actually did so, and it shows that it, it is very well in accordance with numerical solutions here. Exact means that I am performing some numerical analysis on this convex optimization problem. It's shown how the linear response fits perfectly where you expect it to be, which is low energies and so on. The macroscopic regime will, all, will only take a hold once you go to very high energies. Also, the, pro the optimal probability distributions can be shown in close form for the three limiting regimes, and then it all can also be com computed and uh, checked for this particular case. Okay, finally, last remark in, in, this, in this sense is that one of the interesting aspects that you can figure out is, for example, that if you consider this, um, this, this ring and you go for large n, this means that you have a very large number of states, you find interesting relations, for example, not only the, um, the increase in, in power that you can um, that, that you have upper bounded for what whichever control mechanism you can come up with goes like theta squared. This is remember the energy that is inputted by the non-equilibrium environment. But also you have this scaling as one over n, which some, somehow if you can if you, if you can think of this, it can kind of constraints what type of, of chemical cycles you would like to go to if your goal is basically to maximize energy harvesting. Let, let me just drive my 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 main, main point here. So basically, I talked about how. There are limits in, in energy harvesting systems, and this can be actually figured out for any type of control mechanisms uh, as well, uh, as long as you have this distinction between baseline and control. So then you have this type sort of universality. There are closed form solutions that are in three regimes. In the paper we described with a more accuracy that I've been able to uh, have the, the time to do here, how do you can actually um, distinguish these three regimes? And there actually there is a, this a dimensional parameter that you can always compute for any system. Which allows you to do that, and we also generate uh, generalize these for fluctuating environments. So here I talk about environments that are not fluctuating, but you can go beyond that, and it's all explicit in the in the paper. So just uh, allow me to thank again all the organizers and my collaborators and all these uh, funding agencies here, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jordi, for a great talk. Um, there was a question during the in the chat by Tom, oh. so maybe he wants to. Yeah, sorry, I didn't catch that. Hi. Yeah, so a question, thanks for the talk, a question about what alterations you assume. So the 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 default system, I can't remember what you, baseline system, yeah. that yeah. includes the work reservoir, does it? Yes, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And presumably some temperature bath. Yes, heat bath. in the end. Mm -hmm. And you then, imagine adding something to it what do you allow yourself to add do you allow new transitions new states or or varied transition rates of the between the states that's a great question thank you very much for asking it because this is the bit of like the nitty-gritty of the paper i encourage you to, to 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 maybe go find it because it's explicit there but let me give you a few um, answers to this. Yeah, the work reservoir it belongs to the system. So if we, if we go here, before we actually add any control mechanism, the work reservoir is part of the system. The environment is also part of the system. Okay, and the, there's a, there's a, a heat reservoir and you exchange heat with that. Now, control mechanisms, you can add other, other transitions between states. You cannot add new states in general, um, not in the, in, the, in the, I think that you, uh, no, you couldn't do that in general for, for our for our system here. And importantly, and I think I mentioned this, the control mechanism is, I think it, 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 to give you an example, like imagine that your, your environment is a concentration of glucose. What you cannot do is like I say, ah, now I'm going to control the system by increasing the amount of glucose that is in the environment. So therefore you, you would have like some, if you want some vector here, D prime, that would be non-zero. That we don't allow, okay? Now, if you actually uh, consider more complicated environments, you need to be more careful in, in how you define control mechanisms as well, because maybe the way that we define all of this, uh, all of this system, which is using Mar Mar Markovian, Markovian dynamics, although let me just say that you can go beyond that as well, and more terms will need to be added in your upper, in your upper bound. But in Markovian dynamics, you will have to be careful when you uh, allow to have uh, a non-equilibrium, I'm sorry, a fluctuating environment, because basically what you're going to be doing is you're going to be adding the fluctuations of the environment in this matrix here, okay? Because it's, again, all part of the same system. So and, and here, and then, sorry. Well, I was gonna say, just, just getting back to your, like your inspiration was this biochemical 
energy yeah. harvesting thing. So my experience of like a biochemical energy harvesting mechanism, or like maybe not energy harvesting, but energy transduction, yeah, is that is that what what happens is effectively you have a system, and then you couple it to I don't know ATP turnover, and basically what you're doing is providing another pathway to get from A to B via a catalyst that couples you to ATP turnover, for example. And I'm just, I'm wondering how that relates to your yeah. description of the system. I think this is a great question. In, in fact, you can contain all of these phenomena in a single model. Uh, this, this description over here, let me just say, this is sort of like, let's say an observer dependent situation. You really need to be explicit here. What, what are you doing? Of course, that's going to be on the, on, on the part of the scientist to decide wh wh which goes where. But for example, in this case,